I would recommend to everybody to go for the safer 12 versus the really risky 25 over a long period of time, hitting more singles and doubles and making safer returns, which are already very high. If you can make 12% over a very long period of time per year, you're going to do extremely well. You don't need to be shoot swinging for the fences, so to speak, and making somewhere between a negative return and a 25. Uh, you should th think about the risk just the same way you can with stocks and bonds and those types of things, and then uh, adjust your investments accordingly. Listen, everybody, we all know that real estate is the most proven way to build wealth. But why isn't everyone wealthy from real estate then? It's hard to know where to start, and most of the education out there is just complete trash, and you end up investing your money on a series of courses instead of in real estate. That's not how this podcast works. We give you the blueprint to successful real estate investing and bring on guests actually willing to share their secrets. I started my real estate investing journey as a freshman in college when I bought my first duplex and have been in the trenches doing deals ever since. And today, I now own hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. On this podcast, you will learn what you actually need to know to be a successful active or passive real estate investor. And we'll offer our takes on what's happening today so you can navigate this market and build wealth. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Brenneman Blueprint. Welcome to another episode of the Brenneman Blueprint. Today's episode is about the biggest mistakes I see limited partners making in today's market. So what's a limited partner? Those are people who invest in other people's real estate deals. So they partner up with sponsors, which are also called general partners or GPs. The GP, the sponsor, they go out, they find the deals, they do all the work running the deal, and the LPs invest in their deal. And in exchange for this arrangement, the general partner is able to charge fees, and then if it, the deal makes a certain percentage, also get an additional share of the profits in addition to what their money's earning. So uh, without any further ado, I mean, what, what am I seeing LPs sort of doing wrong, if you will, in today's market? I mean, you know, number one, I'm not seeing them oftentimes factoring in the risks involved in a deal. So a lot of times you go to, a, let's say, um, one of those online portals where, you know, whatever you, whatever it is, CrowdStreet or Realty Mogul or uh, pick, pick one. And the deals that seem to do the best with fundraising, it's just all return chasing. No regard for what the risks are, it seems like. So. Uh, that would be my number one uh, mistake I'm seeing people make is you have a apartment deal that might be, or let's say you have an industrial deal that's a very safe deal and the it might make a 12 IRR. And that's, you know, this might be slow to raise money. Meanwhile, you have a vacant office building where they underwrote it, where they're going to renovate it, lease it up and make a 25 IRR. And believe it or not, the office building deal, uh, it raises money better. And if you're actually doing this for a living, you would nine times out of 10, you'd take that industrial deal when you actually are factoring in the risk. So the longer you do this, the more you look at these deals and you go, where are all the ways I can get hurt? And I'm not seeing passive investors factor that in as much. They just think all these estimates are really accurate and likely to happen. And I'll pick the one that makes the most money. When in reality, you know, this underwriting, when you buy the property, this is your best estimate at the time of closing, you know, done based on what you know about the market and industry norms and sort of what you think it'll make in good faith. But, you know, that office building in this hypothetical example, what if they never, never find a tenant and the ownership group is selling it as a vacant deal to the next group? You're going to have lost money. There's no, uh, there's not like you're. There, there's a real binary outcome potentially on that deal. You might make your 25 IRR or you could lose money. Whereas in this industrial deal, the likelihood of making that 12% return is very high. So you're going to have uh, less moving pieces. You already know the rents. I said it was fully occupied. You already can put a permanent loan on it. There's, there's so many less moving pieces. You're very likely to make that 12. And I would recommend to everybody to go for the safer 12 versus the really risky 25 over a long period of time hitting more singles and doubles and making safer returns which are already very high if you can make 12 percent 
over a very long period of time per year, you're going to do extremely well. You don't need to be shoot, swinging for the fences, so to speak, and making somewhere between a negative return and a 25. Uh, you should th think about the risk just the same way you can with stocks and bonds and those types of things, and then uh, adjust your investments accordingly. And, you know, there's a lot of different risks that LPs are not thinking about. They're not in the business. They just think any projected return is uh, likely to happen in the last, you know, decade plus the market's been so good to everybody that that's, you know, usually people have outperformed their projections, but, uh, the different product types within real estate, they carry a lot different levels of risk product types. Those are the terms people, you, people use for apartments or office retail, industrial self-storage hotels. Those are all product types. And they all carry different levels of risk. If you think, if you start and just think about the lease term and the longer the lease term, generally speaking, the safer the deal is, the less risky it is. So then what is the most risky in terms of the income? It would be hotels where you have to rent your place every day, essentially. So that's great when the market's hot and prices are going up, then that's great. You can reset your rents to market every day. Whereas if you're an office or an industrial or retail, you might be, you might be locked in a five or 10 year lease and you can't take advantage of things when uh, rents and the market's running up really high. Well, the same, it works the same way on the downside where having a long-term leased commercial deal is going to be a lot less risky than a short-term rental or hotel deal where you need to re-rent your place every day. So just if you think back to 2020, the you know, hotels and the places with no lease term were not where you want it to be. And that's a risk that you know people are not really thinking about much, as well as now business plan execution risk. Think about that. Let's say in this made up example where you can make a 12 on the industrial deal or a 25 on the office deal, the industrial deal, there's no execution risk. The tenant's already there. You buy it, you run it, you collect the rents, you sell it, you make your 12. Whereas with the office deal, you buy it, you're going to have a temporary shorter term loan on it because it's an empty building. And then you need to rent it out. And now we're just going off projections completely. Was the broker or the sponsor that you got the projections from for rents, was, are they going to be correct when you actually find a tenant? And how long is the time to find the tenant? What they estimated, is that correct? Will it be longer? Will it be shorter? And if it goes longer than anticipated and the rent's lower, I mean, now we're not making 25 anymore. We're making less and returns can drop quickly. So these deals are leveraged, levered up. You know, you're borrowing money against them. So returns can move pretty fast as well as if you think about just the execution on this. Now we just had landed a tenant. Now we need to uh, do some construction to get the space ready for them and refinance the property after that. And maybe interest rates moved. And there's all this execution risk that people aren't generally thinking about when they're an LP. And then same thing, you know, on all product types. So I'm just have this made up office and industrial example, but same thing. Let's say you're looking at two apartment deals and one of them, it's a brand new building leased up, you know, to high, high income earning folks. Uh, there's no deferred maintenance. It's a newer building and the sponsor is projecting a 12% return, just like that industrial deal or another deal. They're projecting a 16% return but it's a weaker tenant pool. It's a 50 year old building that needs to be acquired, renovated. Uh, you're going to put a shorter term loan on it because you are going to want to refinance or sell once you have uh, renovated it. And you need to think about the different risks between those two deals as well. So you have a weaker asset, you have a weaker renter, you have a lot more risk. What if these projected rents after renovation are wrong and you can't get as much as they thought. Now you're not making 16 anymore. You're making less and you took on a lot less risk or sorry, excuse me. You took on a lot more risk to be in this uh, renovation deal. So, you know, you want to think about all the risks involved, whether it's the product type, the business plan, um, cause there's a reason that the return should be higher in those deals, but it's not just a given that, Oh, I'll be in this renovation apartment deal or this office deal. And I always will make more money. 
That's definitely not the case. So there's a lot of other risks for folks to consider too. And I think some of them we have covered in our passive investing guidebook, um, which we have a whole section on different risks. And so like the, the first one we have at the top of the page in there, and I think it's notable. There's, some, there's a lot of these I won't touch on, but we, the market risk, you know, different markets uh, perform differently. For the longest time, institutional investors, they only wanted to invest in the gateway markets. So your New York, LA, San Francisco, those types of cities, because the renter demand and the buyer demand when they go sell is the strongest there. So they perceive that as a lot less risk. So why go into a small city somewhere when I can be in New York City and sell this building a million times over to people from all around the world that want exposure to New York? So think about market risk as well. And then um, let's see what else would be worth uh, mentioning here. Kind of touched on it in the value add deal, but the a functional obsolescence is a term where uh, buildings over time become less functional. So if you think about a really old office building that, um, you know, it's just not as it's not as in demand as a class A newer building. You know, it's going to have smaller windows and more columns and it's just less set up for today's renter. And after a while, it becomes harder and harder to rent those kind of properties out. And as well as there's more capex that's needed, just more money that goes into the property to keep that older building up. So then that's just adding more to the risk profile. On, uh, on commercial deals, not all tenants are the same. You know, I would on apartments and self storage and hotels, they, they all are very similar. I would say, obviously some renters are better than others. Like that goes without saying, but credit risk on commercial deals is really a big thing to think about again, where if you can take a slightly lower return, but we're talking about a bulletproof type tenant, that would be the deal I would do. I would, it's not worth making another potential percent or two to take a more risky tenant on. So I would definitely, I think about credit risk and on any product type, but especially on commercial, at least the nice thing with apartments is they're not so hard to rent out like these commercial properties that you're not losing so much on the, uh, downtime on the asset where it's common in a commercial deal for, be, for it to be vacant for six months or a year before you re-rent it. So, and another risk people, I, I don't think they're accurately assessing is, is the debt. So you have, uh, in all these examples I made up in all the value add deals. So the apartment renovation or the office deal on a unstabilized property, generally speaking, it's a lot harder to get a permanent loan, meaning your fixed rate, 10 year fixed type loan. Most lenders, they want to do sort of a transitional loan, a construction style loan typically might be for two or three years, 18 months, like it's a shorter term loan. So you're adding more risk on with that element. And then also the leverage, like let's say you're comparing two stabilized deals. Uh, what are the different leverage points? You know, a deal where they're borrowing at 50% LTV fixed rate, uh, that's going to make less than someone who's borrowing at 80% LTV, you know, let's say floating rate. They carry far different risk profiles. And, you know, you need to factor in all this where if an apartment deal, it looks amazing, but it's a renovation, they're doing floating rate debt, it's really high leverage, the, them missing, you know, or even, or beating on the upside, I guess, because it's so highly levered. And so uh, you're, you're in a much riskier position than someone who's buying, let's say a newer building with 50% down. So I guess that's, those are the risks I would be thinking about, you know, as a LP today. And I just think that's a complete miss um, from a lot of folks on what, uh, you know, how they're evaluating these deals where they just think these uh, projections are going to be accurate or they'll always beat. And we're going to see deals, you know, that are going to sell in the next two or three years where they had a projection and they didn't beat. Um, and where they'll miss will have to do with the risks involved. It's going to, there's, um, there's a lot of other risks you can read about in our passive investing guidebook if you'd like. Um, but these are the ones that are top of mind for me where I see people just kind of blowing past them on a day to day and, and missing. So if you're interested in reading more in our passive investing guidebook, we have uh, topics like this and just even just basics, like how do you make money investing in real estate? 
why do people invest in real estate, um, just how it all works, uh, written out different product types, why people would invest in those, the different ways you can invest in real estate, tax benefits, how f- the, what uh, fees and just how to, how to evaluate a sponsor. There's a ton of stuff in there. So definitely highly recommend if you're a passive investor or even if you're an active investor and want to learn, um, want to learn about uh, maybe some things that you haven't, haven't seen before. Uh, definitely check that out. And that's at Brenneman.com. You can go to the download section. So Brenneman.com slash downloads and find the passive investing guidebook, just throw in your email or whatever it asks for. And then it just gives you the, the PDF download. So a uh, good tool and not like something you need to read all in one sitting or anything. It's just sort of more of like a resource where there's a big glossary in the back where if you want to know a certain term, let's say you're here, someone say like, oh, the debt yield was seven on that deal. Like what's uh, what's the debt yield? You know, there's a the definition for that in the glossary. So you can see the equation for yourself. So great. We'll appreciate having everyone on the podcast today, giving it a listen. Hopefully this was helpful. We'll see you on the next one. If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, Brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.